was going to, the title of this talk was going to be um, An Echo Modernist Food Manifesto or something like that. Um, and I say, well, I'm just talking to skeptics. Let's do something a little more skeptical related. So what I'm going to try to do is lay out kind of um, a set of criteria and questions, threshold questions that I've asked and I've developed over the last five, six, seven years of trying to figure this stuff out to just make my, to decide whether I think something that somebody's proposing is significant. Can it scale? Can it take on? Will this matter? Um, so that's, and within that I'm going to try to lay out um, a sketch of what I think of an echo modernist or agro-modernist future food system, what the components of that might look like. Some things up in two quick little witty aphorisms. Nothing about is natural about farming. Mimicking nature just has a lot less, it's a lot less important, there's a lot less value in mimicking nature in agriculture than uh, kind of the common zeitgeist of the last 10 years has led people to believe. And not everything that feels sustainable actually is sustainable. Just because something seems like it should be sustainable or kind of has the aesthetic sense of being sustainable doesn't mean it's really lowering impacts, the environmental footprint in relationship to more intensive, sometimes more industrial, mechanized, technological um, approaches. So everybody here have, familiar with the term eco-modernism? No. That came up a number of years ago. Uh, um, Michael Schellenbrenner and Ted Norhouse were kind of spearheaded the movement of about a dozen environmentalists they're coming out of traditional um, environmental groups and have become somewhat disillusioned with the approach. The approaches seem more ideological. They were evidence-based always. They were metrics-based. And one of the things, that the central kind of uh, theme is the idea that instead of <coughs> trying to harmonize with nature, to really reduce human, the impacts of human activity, it's more often better to intensify technologically and make more room for nature. So if we, like the most obvious example, you move more people into cities, there's nothing more unnatural than a city, right? But the more people live in cities, the less in suburbs, the more room there is for forests and marshes and rivers and lakes, right? Um, so this leads to looking at things like nuclear energy, biotech breeding, and agriculture. And that more often than not, we can lower our footprint by intensifying technologically instead of trying to reduce our technological, you know, trying to do things in less technological ways, usually ends up taking up more space. So rewilding and giving more room back to nature instead of trying to make civilization more like nature is a core theme. Um, in the food systems, Biotech GMOs, two early success stories. The first two traits that were introduced into agriculture via biotech, and traits refers to just a, a property to give, you know, uh, disease resistance, insect resistance, non <coughs> apple, what have you. The first two were BT corn. I think BT corn came before Roundup Ready. BT 
is a trait that confers insect resistance on any plant that it's introduced into. So it's, what they did was they took these proteins that are produced by Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a soil bacteria that uh, kills types of insects that eat corn and cotton where the main two crops. So the uh, caterpillar, the corn borer, the weevil, eat, starts eating the plant, the protein goes into their gut, explodes their gut, plant the insect dies, the plant continues to live. No need to apply uh, insecticides. This bacteria, Bt, has been used in organic farming for decades. It's a completely safe to humans and mammals. The result in corn, you can see here, it's continued, there's been some resistance, and it's popped back up, it's been about level. Insecticide use is reduced tenfold. It was 10, now it's at a one. Um, as the BT trait was taken out. And then the, the, I should have said, I think these are two, and you start talking about GMOs, I'm going to go, oh, I think GMOs can be useful, but I'm not crazy about them being used to, you know, put insecticides in food, and I'm not crazy about the idea of, you know, breeding plants so you can spray more um, parasites on them. And advocates of biotech get defensive, and sometimes they try to change the subject, they start having them hard. I say no, go right in. These are the two most impactful innovations in agriculture in the last 30 years. 90% decrease in insecticide use in corn. It's similar in cotton. And that's, and we're gonna get to this. Corn is grown on 90 million acres in the US. I forget what cotton is, because I mostly look at food. Cotton's gotta be 30, 20, 30 million, 15, I don't know. It's a lot, it's a big footprint. So that's huge. Um, the second trait was Roundup resistance, herbicide tolerance. This allows, you spray the herbicide on the plant, the crop, the weeds die, the crop doesn't, the crop thrives. Weed control is the number one problem for all farmers, it's their biggest resource, and weeds steal resources from the crops. This is one of the things that people who aren't involved in agriculture don't really get at a gut level. If you're watering a field, you have weeds, and if it's irrigated water, that water is precious, right? That water is going into a weed that confers no value. If you're fertilizing your field with nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus, and the weeds are sucking that up, those are precious resources that are going into weed. The, the tractor pass, using all that fuel, all gone, eaten up by these weeds. So, there's that. The other thing, other thing to understand is Roundup, the reason why Roundup was chosen is it's the least impactful, least toxic herbicide out of the whole toolkit, which is why it was like, we could use that instead of these other five that will lower our environmental impacts. So you don't get the massive decrease in herbicide use that you saw in insecticide use. This is pounds per acre, and in soybeans it's gone up. But it's swapping out with different herbicides, so you can see the relative toxicity dropping and then stabilizing. That's big, and again, corn, 90 million acres, soybeans, 60 million acres. It's massive. Organic farming. Anybody want to guess if corn is 90 million and soybeans, conventional, are 60 million, 
Anybody want to guess how many million acres of organic farming is happening in the U.S.? Less than, less than one. It's two and a half million. It's tiny. So you know, like, we'll get to that. Um, the other thing that herbicide tolerant crops allowed was a practice called uh, no-till and conventional tillage, which means one way of controlling weeds is to plow your field, break up that growth cycle. If you don't have to do that, you can leave your soil structure intact. You Tillage does a number of things. One, you try the soil carbon, nit reactive nitrogen are released as greenhouse gases. We don't think of that as pollution to till a field. Who would think of that as pollution? Just plow on the field. But it is, if you're worried about global warming. It cuts down on erosion, it keeps the uh, the whole water better, so it lowers your irrigation costs. It does, it's, it's, again, one of the most impactful innovations in agriculture in the last 30 years. So, I'm going to try to get through all this in 45 minutes. I have like, like we said, a six hour talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's your introduction to eco-modernism. So, the last 10 years, innovation in the food system has been a big topic. There's always some new farmers markets, vertical farms. Uh, I can't even keep track of it. You know, there's always some new next best thing. So we're gonna look at the algorithm I've developed to try to assess. You know, I wanna help you as news consumers, citizens, voters, try to assess this barrage of information. Number one, we want to, if somebody's proposing something <coughs> as a, you know, this is going to revolutionize feeding the world, we want to go like, well, is it going to address a major challenge? So we're going to look like, so, what, like, lawns into food. Everybody get rid of your lawn, plant a garden. It's a lovely idea, great idea. I encourage everybody to do it. But at the end, maybe we'll look at what the major challenges are and assess is something like that really going to address any of the major challenges. Um, but this is a paper from just a couple years ago. It was a global food systems paper. Some of the top researchers looked at leverage points for um, improving food systems to deal with the major issues. And what they identified for the U.S. is irrigation and water consumption, excess nitrogen use, excess phosphorus use, and uh, nitro uh, active, uh, reactive nitrogen emissions. Um, in Brazil, it's the deforestation, the rainforest, Similar problems around the world, a little different mix depending on where you are. I'm going to try to mostly focus on the U.S. because that's what we have some impact on. We'll spill into some other issues. Um, so these are the six that I am always considering. Everything else to me is secondary. Greenhouse gas emissions. This is really to nutrient management and the nutrient cycle. So nutrient management is how a farmer manages their use of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium, mostly nitrogen and phosphorus. So are they using as little as possible to get the best yield? Because there's um, a ton of energy used to produce synthetic nitrogen Phosphorus is mined, and there are limited supplies. We can run out someday. So um, you want to manage them, and then you don't want them running into streams, and then into brooks, and then into rivers, and then into uh, the Des Moines water system, and then into the Gulf of Mexico, and turning the Gulf of Mexico 
into a giant lily pad. Soil health is big. We've lost tons, of, you know, disconcertingly large amounts of topsoil. A lot of soil that we do have has been depleted of organic matter and nutrients. Water conservation and management. We have like the Oklahoma, we had the drought in uh, California. And there's a saying that, uh, what is it? I get a shortage of rain is a natural phenomenon. A drought is man-made, which is overstating a little bit. But generally, a drought happens because you haven't been managing your water supply in advance of a shortage of rain. The even more concerning, really, than water use issues, I mean, it's a toss of the West, whether it's California or uh, what's the big river through the Grand Canyon, down oh, the Arizona, Colorado River, huge <laughs> water management issues. Um, but the big one today is the Oklahoma Aquifer under massive amounts in the Midwest. When that goes dry, bingo, it's game over, lights out for that part of the country. And we are not gotten our water use efficient enough, so that's at a rate of refresh where it's going back up, it's still going back down. Land use deforestation, rewilding, is a big one that people aren't involved in ag, and people in general, even environmentalists, uh, thinking about other issues, have a hard time really internalizing land is an input, right? Every acre you use, if, if, if I can grow, round numbers, 100 bushels on an acre versus 50 bushels on an acre, now I only need one acre to get 100 bushels instead of two acres. So I can have one acre of corn and one acre of forest, right? That's a simple model. That's the basic idea. Um, so you want to stop deforestation. If possible, it would be great to rewild. And actually, the footprint of agriculture in America is slightly smaller than it was like 30, 40 years ago. Despite the fact that, you know, it's smaller than I think it was in 1970, population was, what, 200 million, 150, 200 million? In 1970, we're at 320 now. That's intensification, right? That's the fruits of technological intensification. We are, that's not, we I mean, didn't shrink the footprint of that while feeding another 50% of people, citizens, and increasing exports by making farming more like nature. We just squeezed every bit we could out of every acre. Um, and food waste is another, I'm going to touch on that tangentially, that doesn't touch so much on kind of agro-modernist themes, but it's massive. It may be the most important variable of all. It's like energy. You can only efficiency your way or build capacity your way so much when Mostly, you know, we're wasting something on the order of 40% of food ends up in the landfill or plowed under in this country. There's no innovation that could match cutting food waste by half in terms of environmental impact. But that's a devilish, that's a, a wicked, it's a borderline wicked problem. I mean, is that there's an old uh, joke among academic economists, the graduate student says to the professor, oh, there's a $20 bill on the sidewalk. The professor doesn't look dead. That's impossible. If there's a $20 bill, somebody would have picked it up by now. <laughs> like, food waste. There are people losing money on food waste. If it was easy to fix, we would have fixed it by now. It's incredibly hard for 20 reasons plus 20 more. Mm -hmm. Can this problem scale in a significant way? That's massively important. 
it, it, like we, we were, what, the reason why I wanted to compare uh, organic agriculture, organic farming in America, 2.5 million acres. They're still trying to figure out no-till. Organic farmers mostly control their weeds by plowing their fields. Organic does a lot right about their soil. On average, have better soil health than the average conventional farmer. But tillage is a problem. You get wind erosion, water erosion, breaks up soil structure, you get all the greenhouse gas emissions, blah, blah, blah. They've had no-till on a mass scale and conventional for 20 years because of the GMO soy and corn that allows for no-till. They're still trying to figure out, there are researchers working on this problem because it's important in agriculture and, and organic. But it's not going to be adopted by all, on all 2.5, best case scenario, 100% adoption on every acre. It's still only 2.5 million acres of cropland. Meanwhile, you know, when we saw the 40% in soybeans of conservation tillage, that's what, uh, 35 million acres? One innovation, boom. Um, so, how can things scale? One is, you pick a big stage, right? We're gonna, if you can make commodity corn farming more sustainable, you can argue all day whether we should be growing so much corn or not. It doesn't matter. That's how much we're growing. So, and, and I'll, I'm going to talk about some ways that we can produce that amount in ways that would improve the impact effect. But the biggest thing in agriculture you can do is make corn production more sustainable. It doesn't solve an economic problem. If this doesn't put money in somebody's pocket, if this doesn't, there's not an incentive to make this go, it's not going to scale. I had an example today of like a good idea that would be great, except like there's no, like, uh, well, it's one of the reasons why organic farming is still like, I, I was a chef before, yeah, I was a chef before I did this. I was, I've done a couple of things, I was trying to do <laughs> um, So I've been paying attention, like, in, you know, the kind of restaurants I worked at, it's a local, organic, free-range chicken. So I've been paying attention to this stuff for a long time. I've been told, like, organic is growing at 10% a year, every year, for the past 20 years. Well, anybody knows it, anything about compounding interest, you know, it, if it's been doing that, and it cover the Earth and the Moon and Mars and Venus by now. It constitutes 0.6% of acreage in the U.S. It has stalled out, and it's been, like, at a certain level, organic farming doesn't solve any economic problems for farmers. It solves a problem for consumers who want a sense either a sense of lowering uh, their, their impact or cleaner food or you know more authentic food or whatever. But that there's a apparently a ceiling to that. And it, it never solved any problems for farmers. It created economic problems for farmers. That's why it costs more. So that's why it doesn't scale. Does it require a larger social reform in order to succeed on its own? This occurred to me when Vladimir Putin, in, I think it was because he invaded Crimea or Ukraine, the, the EU put sanctions on him, so he put sanctions on them and stopped importing uh, milk from Europe. Well then, Russian cheesemakers couldn't make cheese. And 
he had some complicated fix, bureaucratic fix, to fix that. Like the simple problem was going to be fixed. Like it, the, there are bureaucrats who got money. They decided which farmers to get how much money. You know, this whole Rube Goldberg system, right? For, like if the simple problem requires, you know, like Michael Pollan, we should include the full cost of externalities in our food. So food should be more expensive. And people go, well, what about low-income people? Well, you know, we need to fight poverty and raise weight, you know, like, we need to raise the minimum wage and bring back unions and, um, you know, like, 12 other things that we do not have the political will to do by any stretch of the imagination. So if your little reform needs a much bigger reform in order to work, my guess is it's not going to kind of get wings and take off. Um, so let's look at scale a little bit. Large conventional farms, 638 million acres. That's it's a fairly arbitrary definition of a large farm. I picked 500 acres um, in commodity crops. That's still considered a small farm. In, uh, if you're grazing, that's small. Um, a better measure would have been by income, but like the trunk looking for his, you know, keys under the lamp. This is the data I had. So it's 500 acres. It's a big farm, smaller is um, 273 million acres. This is a small conventional farm. Organic farms bigger than 500 acres, 1.5 million acres, small organic, or million. I look at this and I think, like, when you read the New York Times about reforming the food system, making it more sustainable, you would think that organic makes up like 30% of all agriculture in the U.S. It's 0.6%. Why are we having a discussion about how to make these bigger? Let's double them. Who cares? <laughs> Let's make this and this more sustainable. If we make this 10% more sustainable, that's a much bigger deal than doubling this, even if I thought organic was more sustainable, which I don't. But even granting that, double it. I don't care. 10% better. Right there, that's the grail. Crop acreage. So again, when we're talking about farming, you probably think of the maybe like I used to flash on maybe the produce section at the grocery store, or you know a farm outside a, a CSA outside of Portland where I live that you know they drop off a box with 45 different vegetables and 10 I've never heard of and three. <laughs> I'll eat anything. I still won't eat them. <laughs> so this is soybeans, forage, corn, hay, wheat. So 65 million. This is corn for just for food. And again, I fudged the number. It's hard to really <coughs> break it up. They say 40% of four, uh, corn goes into ethanol, so I just use that. I've had the economists from the Corn Growers Association bitch at me because a lot of that then comes back and it's fed to a lot of stock after they make ethanol. So whatever, it doesn't matter whether it's here or here. It's a lot bigger than this. This is orchards, um, 5 million acres, 4 million acres of vegetables. All vegetables in the U.S. Four million acres. Ah, uh, canola, beans, beets, berries. I don't know why beets get their own. Oh, <laughs> um, sugar. sugar. Oh yeah. Sugar. Oh yeah. Sure. Those aren't vegetable beets. Those are sugar beets. <laughs> so the beets are probably down here again. Also, we did this a couple months ago when I looked at it again today. I was like, Forage and hay. I'm not really clear why 
it was a broke, I sort of know, I don't understand it well enough to explain it to you. You probably don't care or need to know. Potatoes, one million acres, sweet corn, lettuce, canned tomatoes, and then onions, and it drops off. I mean, carrots, you think they're in everything. Onions, I mean, onions are in everything. This is uh, 250,000 acres right here. That's over 175,000 acres of onions. They're in every freaking thing <laughs> I eat all day long. Um, so when you're talking about making, when you're talking about farming, you're talking about this. If you're talking about making farming sustainable, you're talking about this, by and large. Um, frustratingly, like, there's been uh, a BT potato for like a decade or more that would allow you to grow potatoes without insecticides or much less insecticides. To do that, you need, what do you need on your side? You need McDonald's. McDonald's wouldn't do it because they didn't want to have the discussion with their customers. They're, and it takes a lot of insecticides to grow potatoes because potatoes don't rotate well with other crops. They're just grow, like Maine, Idaho, they grow potatoes. Nothing else grows there, you're stuck with potatoes. So you can't break up the pest cycle by just moving in another crop. So they just spray it with a lot of insecticides. It was easier for McDonald's to keep selling, and I don't want to, insecticide use is very safe for the consumer. Maybe not for local communities, farm workers, I don't want to fearmonger about insecticides and potatoes, but it was easier to just keep using insecticides on potatoes, one of the highest insecticide use, than to have a conversation with their customers and say, hey, we can use a lot less insecticides in your french fries with these biotech potatoes. But it was too difficult a conversation because of all the fearmongering. Couple giving myself too much credit. This is not really biology 101. <laughs> um, these are three things related to biology that I think about when I'm assessing whether I think an idea matters. What does farming require? Farming requires soil, sun, space, lots of space, 90 million acres for corn, 65 million acres for soy. It's in, there's a lot of food innovations that are supposed to revolutionize the food system that are denominated in square feet. Farming is not denominated in square feet. Farming is denominated in tens of thousands, if not millions of acres. Protein is the bottleneck. Nitrogen is biologically expensive. It's energetically expensive to make it synthetically, it's expensive in, within um, ecosystems to produce it. Carbs are cheap There's, because it's ecologically cheap, because carbon's ecologically cheap. What plants do is pull carbon out of the air via photosynthesis and turn it into cell structure. Now, like one day the light went off in my head, like why there wasn't a hole where the plant, where the seed used to be. Like I kind of had this model of the soil being turned into the plant. The plant is just carbon pulled out of the air, right? The, and it, that's a very, uh, fairly efficient, very easy chemical reaction. Nitrogen in the air, 75% of our air is nitrogen, but it's a triple bond, it's a very powerful bond. It's hard to break, it's expensive. That's why protein is expensive. So, an innovation doesn't have to deal with the bottleneck of protein, but that's definitely one of my considerations. If, if I'm going to take something seriously, I generally want to see it dealing with the problem of lowering the impact of protein production, or in developing nations, making protein 
uh, cheaper and more available to citizens. Entropy versus conversion. Livestock are warm-blooded animals. They're throwing off heat all day long trying to maintain a stable uh, body temperature, right? So and they, they require lots of energy, lots of water, and they create major <laughs> waste streams in converting energy into fat and protein. Plants and insects and single-celled organisms, on the other hand, do not come, they are not or blooded, they're cold blooded or they don't have blood. Um, they aren't trying to maintain a uh, homeostatic uh, body temperature, which is a huge, in, it's hugely inefficient in terms of harnessing a biological system to make pro protein and fat. On the other hand, in defense of livestock, there's a ton of area of land mass covered by highly dense cellulosic uh, plants that humans can't eat, but grazing animals can, and they transform them into milk and meat and turn land that we could not use to produce food for humans into useful, delicious, nutritious food. So those are things you need to take into account and think about when you're assessing different, you know, which of those are you harnessing? So grazing harnesses that. Feedlot feeding doesn't. Although even that is more efficient than you might think, I still don't support it. <laughs> um, but it's a much more of a push than you might think. But so those are the, that's the main framework that I try to use to assess things. So modalities that I think keep your eye on. These are things that I think might take off. They might be innovations that could help. I think they, these are the things worth keeping your eye on. Um, and we're going to look at three areas, traditional rural farm and urban and peri-urban systems. So peri-urban is farming that happens, like Portland has a lot of great peri-urban farming, farming that happens around, ringing around an urban area, a lot of time, and a lot of interactions. Generally, when I think of peri-urban farming, I also think that there are commercial relationships between the uh, the farms in the city. So there are, if you're growing grass seed in the Lama Valley, you're maybe te you're close to a city, but I would not consider, like, you're selling the grass seed to Scotts and it's, you know, for golf courses in Phoenix, Arizona. I don't consider that peri urban farming, no matter how close <laughs> you are to Eugene or Salem or Ben. And then we'll get some industrial production systems. So things to look for in traditional urban farming. One is getting conservation ag. And this somewhat contradicts what I said, not really, in that these are systems that aren't about uh, technological in intensification, but they're uh, ecological techniques. You know, Conservation Act, the first three, anyways, they don't really mimic nature, though. They're ecological without mimicking nature. No-till and conservation tillage, we've talked about. Cover crops in diverse rotations. Cover crops is, um, you know, once you've harvested your crop, you plant another crop, usually not a cash crop, although sometimes, I mean, if you can pull it off, Cash crop is great, but the, the idea, and, and um, ideally, not always, uh, a legume, roots and tubers are useful as well. You lay down a crop and you're trying to stop erosion over the winter. Uh, you're trying to 
put some green matter and organic material back in the soil, build soil structure. It's a lot of great uh, benefits to cover cropping. Cover cropping is tough. It's an investment because you're, you you got to pay for the seed. You got to pay for uh, the fuel to the past to plant the seed. It's your time, uh, opportunity cost with your time, and there's no immediate payoff. It, the only payoff is if it makes your farm more productive. That's not always the case either. It's a you know it can be a bush and you end up paying for cover crops. Uh, so there's that in diverse rotations is uh, you know there's a lot of talk about monoculture farming, which is really a, a, what people usually mean is non-diverse rotations. And there's no hard and fast answer. Corn soy rotations, it's only two. They're done, you know, thousands of acres, just one, as far as the eye can see, all at once. It has its own problems, but it can also be incredibly efficient, which again shrinks the uh, footprint. But diverse rotations have a lot going for them. They build uh, soil fertility or deplete it less slowly. They can, uh, different crops use different nutrients. So you can, uh, you know, by filling one crop with another, you're just getting more out of the soil. Uh, you're breaking up pest rotation, pest cycles, etc. Those are three kind of ecological styles of farming that are growing. We'd like to see more of them. Um, this is getting more, we're seeing a bit more speculative. I think watch for novel integrations of crop and livestock. So some of it's kind of everything old is new again, like farming beef and crops together instead of just one and just the other. So the, your manure management problem becomes a soil nutrient solution. And then maybe I just talked to a guy this fall out in, in, uh, near the Dallas in uh, Sherman County, who's like the first guy in two generations to get his neighbor to come. He did cover crops after wheat, first guy in the county and forever, and he got his buddy uh, to bring his cattle over Crazy. and graze. Mm -hmm. So that stuff is percolating back up again. It's, it's considered innovative, but it's, it's innovative because it takes balls when all the old guys around town are laughing at you. <laughs> um, but th I think there's also going to be, like, this is really novel. I haven't really heard of anybody doing this. I just know the nutrient cycle works. I'm waiting for somebody. Nobody ever listens to me, but eventually someone will. <laughs> is put together chicken and tilapia together. Tilapia and like combine. The, they, there'd be a lot of uh, synergy there. Anaerobic digesters, we're starting to see those on dairy farms. Methane is more, what, 40 more times potent than carbon uh, as a greenhouse gas. You collect the methane as it rises, um, creates a ton of heat as it compresses into biogas. You can turn the biogas into an energy source on farm or municipalities that are doing this with their waste streams. And then the, the uh, whether you're doing the manure or just in the barn with the burps, with the manure, uh, the manure breaks down into a fairly clean, easy to manage soil amendment that is a lot less problematic uh, to manage than just raw manure. Sorry. But aerobic digesters in um, urban, peri urban systems, I think, and would like to see a much bigger use of taking our waste stream from the city. The nutrients I call it, I forgot. To, uh, we skipped over that. Nutrient cycle. The big problem is, okay, you put the nutrients into the soil. The nutrients go into the crop. 
crop goes from Iowa to New York City. You eat them. Now the nutrients are in New York City. And how do you get them back to Iowa? You know, you take them out of the Central Valley, you bring them to LA. Now they're stuck in LA. How do you get them back? I don't know that we can get the nitrogen and the phosphorus from New York City back to Iowa. But I think we could get it from, back from Portland back into the Wyoming Valley as a soil amendment um, and an energy source for the city. Um, or from Salem, from Ben, Eugene, blah, blah, blah. Kelp farming. Um, we're starting to see a little bit about this. Something I don't know a lot about. about um, and that's happening kind of like in, uh, you know, offshore in um, ocean areas. My question, this is like Professor Horatio Horn, Penny Fox, big ideas. Why aren't we kelp farming in the Mississippi? There's all this nitrogen and phosphorus rolling down the river, right? We should be doing multi-trophic aquaculture in the Mississippi. Multi-trophic aquaculture is uh, where you're farming kelp the seaweed and then you know the uh, mussels and then like the minnows and then the you know whatever the sea bass or trout or whatever um, so it's a multi you know all the parts of the system you got all this excess nutrients headed barreling towards the Gulf of Mexico let's put farms like in nets under barges anchored in the Mississippi so my idea of seaweed farming and multi-trophic farming in the Mississippi River is probably not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've actually placed a hedge on the markets against that idea, <laughs> even though I think it's a good one. Um, high tip, precision ag. This is just making using technology to make farming much more efficient, super hyper efficient. Drones, big data, GPS, remote sensors, satellite imagery. So you've got 10,000 acres of corn and soy, and now you can see it from above. You can scout and go like, oh, you know, like it, I can see that I've got erosion that I didn't know about, or I've got water boiling up. You can, the combines now, can track yield on like a, you know, 15 square foot. So like, why is my yield dropping here? You know, I need to tile and fix my irrigation or apply and fix the soil. Sir? Uh, and sometimes there's a couple of acres where you don't even see it until you're like, oh my God, look at this desert. <laughs> yeah. Because the weevils were really right. crazy. Yeah. Now yeah. drones, yeah. you know, um, Good uh, differential treatment. That was what we were doing. Is technically it affects pesticides. Yeah. And then determining where it should be treated, where you should. Right. So. And instead of like treating the whole farm, it's like it's it's surgical it's treatment. Or not treating at all. Exactly. Biotech breeding. I'm going to expand on that a bit. Precision irrigation is where you know you're applying. I like precision ag. Now the combines can drop the seed with exactly the amount of fertilizer they need as it goes in. It's one pass. It's not spread around us. It's like right on the seed and comes out. So those are going to be huge. Precision irrigation again, like the exact amount of water when you need it. You've got sensors. It like the irrigation is tied to the sensors, so you're not guessing. You're like I know how much moisture is in the soil. Turn on the um, robotics. On farm solar powered ammonium nitrate production is a possibility. I've talked to very early uh, breakthrough in, in, in Yale in terms of figuring out the catalyst that reduces the energy required to break that bond triple bond, um, that they, they took it from the soil rhizomes, they finally figured out how the rhizomes did it, 
and figured out how to do it synthetically. When I talked to him, he was like, yeah, you know, if you had a little solar cell, a little photovoltaic cell, be enough energy, you take um, water and you know, a little solar panel, you make nitrogen fertilizer right on the farm for free. Um, then I talked to soil scientists who specialize in nutrient management. They're horrified because price of nitrogen goes down, the cost of overusing it goes down, right? So everything's a trade-off. Precision ag, again, or precision irrigation, again, all those plastic lines, that's not free ecologically, right? Um, to even to go from one of those big farms to just riding the lines, they don't have an endless lifespan either. Mm -hmm. They need to be pulled out and placed. You know, that there's everything's a trade-off. That should have been should have been three aphorisms. Um, I apologize for shorting you guys an aphorism. <laughs> don't do that again. <laughs> um, what can you do as consumers? Not much. Um, <laughs> one thing you can do in terms of like, people are like, what's, if I could do anything with my diet, what's the one change I could make? Like, eat more lentils. Um, but really, if you want to see diverse rotations, so the, the, the uh, chef Dan Barber, famous chef, very tied to Alice Waters, Michael Pollan kind of view of the world, wrote a book a couple years ago. And it was very precious. I don't think any of his ideas skilled. We did have one good insight, which is he wanted to see more diverse rotations, but in his restaurant, he only wanted to serve like his favorite best ingredient. Like, we get the rotations we demand. The reason why we grow 90 million acres of corn is because we demand. 90 million acres of corn. So you want diverse rotations. 13 bean soup. 10 grain hot cereal. Every day. Breakfast, lunch. Never <laughs> You can even have a little smoke in a But isn't the reason they grow so many corn because it's such a diversely used product? It is. It's, the corn's a miracle. You can't. It, it's getting corn for a reason. It's incredibly productive. In terms of like you can't nothing except maybe bamboo turn sunlight and water into biomass faster and more efficiently, and then you can use it for everything. I mean, I'm not clear why we grow anything else. <laughs> you can make black beans out of corn. <laughs> Perry, urban, urban feedback systems, anaerobic digesters, we talked about that, creating that uh, rural urban or peri urban loop. Watch for black soldier flies. These are really interesting. Black soldier flies will eat any flipping thing you stick them on and turn it into dirt, good soil, and then uh, pop out larvae which are a brilliant source of protein, which in some countries, culturally, they may be geared to eating them. That would be great. In this country, it can be used as livestock feed. So you can turn, we can turn our urban waste into soil amendment and livestock feed. You see, that's a running um, theme. In terms of urban farms, I'm, cut, I'm bullish on urban mushroom farms. Mushrooms can turn. They love coffee grounds. We love coffee. <laughs> we produce tons of coffee grounds every day. And it's not, that, it's not that big a deal to have an urban mushroom farm and have a couple vans looping to coffee shops <coughs> every other day or so, grabbing coffee grounds, turning them into uh, Mushrooms, they will grow on food waste, sawdust, uh, cardboard, turn into mushrooms, microproteins, leathers, soil amendment. If you 
you go back to the criteria, mushroom farming solves some economic problems. It, you know, coffee houses have waste, they have to pay to get it towed it away. Instead, somebody can tow it away for free. Now, I think there's enough there that, and again, some of these are, are speculative. Here's my better catch on some of these, but I think mushroom farms are something to watch. Cricket farms the same. Crickets can eat food waste. And uh, early research is getting challenged these days. The conversion rate of food, of feed to protein for crickets is thought to be better than chickens. And chickens are the best of all um, the livestock. Poultry. But it's looking like they're about even, but then um, when you consider the space that can be done in the closing those nutrient and food waste loops within a city, uh, much more, they require much less water than uh, poultry, and the, uh, the waste, the soil amendment, is much easier. It's just dirt to manage than chicken. Uh, chicken doo doo. <laughs> and there's, we just ran a thing on our website about cricket farming in, or in Zimbabwe, eating bugs in Africa. And it's the, I forget the, the insect, but it's very prized, common, stable food in Uganda. And they, they started farming it industrially. And it really took the pressure off of a, a, a valuable, fragile forest or jungle system that they used to go in and take the, the insects out to eat. Um, I don't know that we're culturally, you know, I, I think cricket, most bugs I doubt were ever going to really move the needle in the US. Crickets, might become a fad if chefs pick up on that. It's a crunchy fried more food. Maybe, maybe not. There's cricket powder, you know, in baking, in power bars, power shakes. The sky's the limit. Well, the limit is the protein flour. Uh, but I also think crickets can be fed to livestock. They can be fed to aquaculture, use the soil amendments. And then, uh, this is kind of a restatement, but keep your eye in these very urban urban feedback systems for these integrated livestock aquaculture culture, um, crop systems that I think could be interesting. So I guess this is Sarah, this is a small company called MyoWorks. They're making leather out of uh, mushrooms or mushroom skin, turning sawdust into uh, fine leather items. Uh, you can turn, it's, I don't know if you've ever had corn. Jason probably has, it's, it's not that good. I had it. <laughs> it's okay, I mean, if I was, I think oh, I might have yeah. it occasionally. It's not but. You talking about that fungus that grows on corn? No, no, no. that's Guido Lacoche, the Mexican truffle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what does it make or describe it? Uh, it's in the frozen section. Q, yeah. Q O R N. No U. Oh. <laughs> no. They got rid of the meat and the U after the Q. I think they had hamburgers before, those were terrific. What about that leather? Is that actually <laughs> durable? Apparently, I haven't tried it. I just read about it on Popular Science. Um, it's the chair he made. Not for everybody, but yeah. stylish in some quarters. <laughs> um, what to look for in industrial production systems? Synthetic biology. This is where you uh, engineer, you uh, genetically engineer single cell organisms, usually al algae, yeast, bacteria, um, sometimes fungi, to um, excrete, burp, shit, you know, whatever you want them to. So, 
They've got algae producing uh, palm oil or a palm oil substitute. Palm oil is very hard to duplicate, very valuable, also incredibly environmentally destructive. There's been a lot of push to improve practices. They're getting there, but if we could, you know, just grow in vats by taking, you know, sugar cane or the stuff from the dumpster from the restaurant, all the better. Um, using big data to identify and synthesize, oh, it's scarce aromatics. They're producing uh, vanillin in vats now, which is like vanilla is again like a very fragile ecosystem that it's grown in. So if we, everything's on a trade off. You take that, you start growing, take away vanilla farms, it's good for the jungle environment, and we start growing it, you know, in, um, you know, Corvallis or somewhere. You know, that, all those farmers lose their livelihood in a very, also a fragile economy. You can't win. Uh, sometimes you can. Um, big data. It's just a story of uh, just mayo. Has anybody seen that new vegetarian or vegan mayo? What they did was they created this huge database of foods, crops, <coughs> different plant materials, and indexed all like the amino acids and compounds in each one. And they said, what do we need to produce uh, eggs, you know, the proteins? to make a proper mayonnaise. They just ran it, the punch cards came, popped out, and they're just like, it's this yellow pea, has the protein you need, and add it with this and that, and boom, and it's, I did a blind taste test, I prefer the just mayo. Really? It's good. It's good. And then, synthetic and in vitro meats and cheeses, some of these, will be, they'll be using these, but again, Protein is the bottleneck. So that's, if you told me, I don't know if that's ever gonna go. It's, there's a boatload of hurdles, um, but we'll see. Um, plus I think that'll be just plant-based. And it's gonna be, we're gonna see it in sausages and like, they're gonna be, you're gonna get pepperoni before you get a steak. Well, the burger, the Impossible Burger, is supposed to be impossibly, to, impossible to detect. Yeah. Uh, so your farmers that I heard recently, 13 years, or the, the, within 13 years, you start training to make uh, construction crews together. I had 13 years, six months. So just mayo. This is the impossible burger. Um, what they did with the impossible burger is again they like used uh, big data to figure out what are the elements we need to because I mean at the end of the day hamburgers a collection of compounds, right? You put those compounds together, got a hamburger. So it's like with just potato and wheat and blah blah blah. The, the X factor is the blood flavor, the heme is the protein liquid. And they discovered they could get it from plant sources like soy, uh, soybeans, but it was too expensive, you know, I mean, like to take all these soybeans and crush them just to get the heme and then you like environmentally friendly burger, you take all the soybeans and then get, you know, take what you need and then you have all the soybeans. But they ended up doing is engineering uh, yeast to just produce heme. So, uh, was that, and then this is a project, this is a real vegan cheese. I don't think it's passed, it's still like in the indie go go or fundraising stage. They want to uh, engineer yeast to produce milk proteins, produce milk, make cheese. You have cheese that is cheese, but also vegan. It's like life, it's a wave and a particle. <laughs>
<laughs> what to watch your crop breeding? This is like getting the on base average up. Watch for biofortification, adding, you know, making it more nutritious, adding beta carotene, zinc iron. And they're, the famous one is golden rice, where they're putting beta carotene, the precursor to vitamin A, in rice, so it can be uh, easily grown in areas that are deficient uh, in, that have huge problems with vitamin A deficiency and children go blind. It's also a problem in Uganda. In Uganda, the government is funding a uh, 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 golden banana, beta carotene, and rich banana. That's a staple up there. That's one thing I've been to. It's proteins, stable crop. I mean, I didn't make it explicit. Stable crops. It's not always wheat, but wherever you are. Stable crops are what you want to watch. Um, drought tolerance, disease resistance. This is the big one, um, especially for people who like to eat and drink well. Because the crops that are most vulnerable to the disease are the ones you can't swallow. Like the disease comes, okay, we'll plant something else. It doesn't work with an orange grove, apple orchard, banana plantation, cacao grove, coffee grove, uh, a great vineyard, right? So uh, the blight comes in, the will comes in, the rust comes in, you're screwed. And then um, those are also tend to be uh, genetically identical plants, so they're also, that's also you know, every Cavendish banana is exact, the DNA is exactly the same. We don't have any other commercially viable bananas to switch to. Um, so, if you like apples, oranges, orange juice, wine, bananas, <laughs> uh, chocolate, good coffee, Disease resistance is going to be a big deal. The big swing for the fences is the speculative stuff. They or may not get there. It may just be too hard. Um, nitrogen fixation. Again, that's right. Like, plants that fix their, own, fix their own nitrogen don't really fix their own nitrogen. They have a symbiotic relationship with soil bacteria in their uh, roots, their root nodules, where they do this trade, and again, I understand, but not well enough to explain it to other people. Um, that's going to be a tough nut to crack. If we do, that's the whole, you know, this lecture probably references like six different holy grails. Um, so it's a polytheistic religion that <laughs> uh, also uses grails to drink from. Uh, Nitrogen fixation is huge. Speeding up photosynthesis is another massive move. <clears throat> Yield is how much biomass can you create in a certain amount of space. One way to do it is just to get it to go faster. And you, like, maybe you can get two crops in while the sun is out, right? Um, if you, instead of six months, you get it done in three months. Or, so you get it from six months to three and a half months, and you kind of have two shitty half months on either end. <laughs> two crops are better than one. Rubisco, again, this is like the first step in photosynthesis. I understand it well enough, but not to explain to you. Improved albedo, this is a little esoteric um, way to global warming. Albedo is the term would refer to uh, the Earth's reflective power. So, sun comes in, we reflect it back, that's warming, instead of absorbing that energy. There are breeders working on getting the leaves to tilt and follow the sun. Oh, oh back. One way to speed up photosynthesis is to, uh, I read about this the other day, really fascinating, is there's a like, Plants react to the sun. Cloud comes by, they shut down. Cloud goes away, takes them 45 minutes, an hour, an hour, an hour, 
kind of get back up to speed. They're working on just cutting that down. Um, improved albedo. Can you change the tint of the leaves? Can you change the angle of the leaves or how they fall in the sun to reflect? Now, that, this, here's a problem with my criteria. This doesn't solve an economic problem for anybody. So it's technologically really hard not to crack, and then there's no commercial application. Um, but it might be something that governments do in planting park, you know, trees and parks. You know, who knows? I mean, you're never going to get me to argue against basic research. You just kind of, at one level, we just got to keep throwing stuff against the wall. But that one does fail my criteria for, I just think it's so interesting to be such a bomb. <laughs> But that's that's that, that's gonna be a battle. So this has been about like why this innovation but not that innovation. Like people are all excited about vertical farms. I'm not. <laughs> why? And part of that is like one of the very like you gotta choose which variables you think are variables in which are fixed. Like with bugs, eating bugs could lower our footprint. But I think for the most part, one person sees culture as a variable, I kind of dial it in as, okay, as a constant. For the moment. I, I don't know how much that like that's gonna move. So you gotta make an assessment there. Political will, culture, uh, just Path dependency. You know, like if you know, forty thousand farmers have invested four hundred thousand dollars each in combines, we're not going to suddenly switch to agriculture that doesn't involve combines anytime soon. Um, so some stuff's just kind of locked in. There's a corporate pushback on change. There's also, you got to figure out the variables. So, how are we doing for time? Take a break. Take a break. Oh, my. So, okay. <laughs> so what that take? 35 minutes to get to here? <laughs> I was going to do a little, you know, like, I think if you look at these, which are very popular in the zeitgeist, next wave innovations that are going to revolutionize, None of them meet my criteria. Whether you think my criteria work or not, that's why I don't think they're real. I mean, there are good reasons for farmers' markets. I love them. I think they make for vibrant cities. They help farmers make a living. You know, and certain niche farmers turn a profit. They build community. They do place banking. I've got nothing against them. I just don't think they're going to substantially lower the environmental impact of food production in America. Same community gardens. Vertical farms. That's kind of the, the, the uh, quick case study I was going to go out on. Vertical farms. And, and I chose skeptics for, you know, often like enthusiastic about technology. This seems like a very technological solution. Vertical farms, let's go back. What does a farm need? Need sun, soil, land, you know, space. Vertical farm has none of those. It's denominated in square feet, not acres, right? They're generally done with hydroponics. It doesn't close any nutrient, like the, the, the value added in an urban farm to me is closing nutrient loops. Right? You've got all this food waste, you've got human boot, you've got all sorts of shit. You turn that into food. Hydroponic vertical farming systems don't do that. What they do do is produce expensive salad greens, mm -hmm. herbs, um, sometimes tomatoes, and some bell peppers. And not, they're good at turning water 
into food. But they still have, you now you still need energy to turn, you know, you have to replace the free energy of the sun with, you know, unless you have nuclear, or, you know, unless you have solar panels, a huge solar farm turning solar power into electricity to power your LED lights. It makes no sense. It's ridiculous. But there's going to be a shit ton of money invested and wasted on vertical farms in the next 20 years. Um, which again, anybody listen to me, save them a lot of money. So, Jason. Um, we're, we're pretty short on time, so I think we're going to, uh, I'll do one last question from the internet for you. And then okay. uh, our buddy Sean from Cherry City Skeptics here has asked a question. He said, is global climate changing the model of crop rotation cycles or even eliminating crop choices from the rotation? And are we seeing any effect of that currently? Yes. Um, seasons are shifted the beginnings and ends the seasons are shifting already um that's a big thing it's not super drastic and what crops do well just so some crops are, are moving a bit north now in north america so um you know where you can grow corn is drifting north where canola thrives is you know, the southern boundaries and oats are, are shifting. Let me share one insight I had about that in terms of there's a big push of, well, if that's happening, we should start uh, trying to make our local, or our re not local, but regional food systems more resilient start growing a bigger mix of crops locally, you know, and that, which means growing inefficient, crops inefficiently that do better somewhere else, but we'll, at least we'll be ready. Here's why that doesn't make sense. Two reasons. One is, you plant new crops every year. So you don't have to, like, you can, you don't have to, like, be ready with this arsenal of crops, although, you know, you want to have knowledge and expertise. Now have some investments in equipment. But it's not like it doesn't take, you know, a generation to learn to start growing oats, you know, in, in your neighborhood. The other thing is that what's going to happen is supply routes just, you know, like it's easier to just get your distribution and supply routes to shift around the map than to try to start growing crops where they don't belong. Um, so the vet, like this is again, what are the what are the real variables versus like what we would like them to be? A lot of people would like the variable to be, we're gonna have more diverse regional food systems because that's what they want to know. Like they keep coming up with new reasons to go back to the old model of diverse regional food systems. Probably not going to happen because it doesn't make economic sense. If you start growing oats someplace where oats don't grow that well, you're going to get beat on the market by Canadian oat farmers. You can't compete with them. So what's going to happen is just the the uh, transportation, shipping, packing, all that infrastructure. That's much easier to move around because the market will just do it. That's something, you know, I'm, I'm, I love markets, but I also think there are things markets aren't so good at, government as well. But one thing markets are good at is responding to that kind of information, you know. Prices are, you know, crop yields, oats are moving this way, canola's moving this way, corn's going that way. They just move. That's it. I also don't want to underplay the gravity of the situation. There are parts of the world where, you know, for farmers who are not in advanced industrial democracies, where they have non-resilient uh, food systems and they're operating on a shoestring, it's going to be devastating when their staple crop doesn't work anymore and there's not a new staple crop. 
Here it's okay. Like, if we stop farming in parts of Kansas, people will move, different industries will move, you know, it'll be uncomfortable, but we'll survive. We'll just bring it that way. Like, those people aren't eating the food grown in Kansas locally anyways. But if you're if you're in a subsistence or just above a subsistence level of farming, then it's a very big deal if your staple crop stops working and there's nothing to replace it. That's a big I don't want to because I think just because I don't think we should rejigger our regional food systems into a, a patchwork quilt of crops again doesn't mean I don't think we should be doing everything we can to slow or uh, stop, reverse, whatever. To go warming is a big deal. All right. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mark.